So the second paragraph of the U.S. Declaration of Independence states that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creators with inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Early in my career, I believed this to be true across the board, that all men and all women have equal opportunities and we're all to be treated equally. And I was never really confronted with the inequities of our society until a tragic accident left me with a spinal cord injury at the age of 26. And from that point forward, I was thrown into the world of paralysis and immediately became a member of the minority class, those of us living with disabilities. There are over 57 million people in the United States living with some form of disability. Many of them are not visible, and many of them live on the fringes of society. So you can imagine it's only a few months after my injury and I'm trying to reintegrate into society in this new form, in this new form as a wheelchair user. And I'll never forget this moment. I was in downtown Concord, New Hampshire with my physical therapist and we were maneuvering sidewalks and curb cuts and uneven streets. And it was the first time I had ever been out in public. And the first stranger we encountered was this man who came up to me and he put his hand on my head and said, God loves you, you are blessed, and then immediately walked away. <laughs> and I was thinking, is this the way it's gonna be? <laughs> well, it's not really like that, really. But people do treat you differently. Like when you roll into a room and people are staring but they really don't wanna get caught looking at you or the proverbial pat on the head, and oh dear. Or I love this one, hey, you better slow down, you're gonna get a speeding ticket. And I could go on about things that people say to you. But the one valid look that I get is a look that I get from fellow members of minority classes. It's that look that says, yeah, you know what it's like. Like what you say? To be excluded. You see, we have laws in place that tell us that we are to be treated equally. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1964. We have the Americans with Disability Act of 1990 that tell us that we are all to be included. But those are only guidelines. How we act is what truly shapes our society. At one point in our nation's history, these images were commonplace, where we blatantly excluded people in a minority class, and we thought nothing of it. And I'm grateful to say that today, these are no longer common, but these are. How is it any different? I've spent my fair share of going into buildings through the back cargo bays, or into restaurants through the kitchen, or where they deliver food. And the funny thing is, it's a true reflection of how we treat each other. How we treat each other as human beings. And look around, you'll see examples of that. Does it say we're separate but equal? But there are examples in society that we can point to to drive us in the direction of a much more inclusive society. Why can't we move into something of universal design where we have images like this that become commonplace. And a real great example is what gravitated me to the sport of sailboat racing. You see, this is a common image of a mark rounding at a sailboat race. In one design sailboat racing, the boats are all the same, the equipment's the same, the rules are all the same on the water, and we're all treated equally, we're all punished and rewarded equally. But if you look back at the docks, you'll see something like this. And that's because in sailboat racing, we use adaptive techniques and technologies to compensate for our disabilities on the water so we can compete on an equal basis alongside our able bodied sailors. And that's when technology becomes the equalizer. Technology can also break down our societal barriers. In 2012, Oscar Pistorius became the first person to blur the lines between Olympic and Paralympic when he was a double leg amputee competing in both games. Now, regardless of what you might think of him as a person, 
It was the prosthetics, the innovation in the prosthetics legs that helped to elevate him to that level. And today, we're using 3D printers to create upper arm prosthetics for children, where they get to choose their favorite color or their favorite superhero, and suddenly they become the envy of their able-bodied friends. Think about how that makes those children feel included. And we have pioneers on the front lines today in the world of neurotechnology. It's a world where we're mer merging medical electronics with the human nervous system. And these pioneers are blazing the trails today in this world. Now, you probably think I'm going to mention an engineer or a scientist, right? But I'm not. Because you see, in flight exploration, we celebrate the pilots. We celebrate people like Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart and Chuck Yeager. In space exploration, we celebrate the astronauts like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and Sally Ride. And in all of those cases, those people put their lives on the line for the advancement of technology and science. And in the world of neurotechnology, there are people that are doing that today. There are test pilots that are putting their lives on the line. There's people like Jim Jadich. He dove into the shallow end of a lake on a hot summer day and became a quadriplegic. But later, he became the first person to be implanted with a prosthesis that allows him to use his arms and his hands, and he was able to return to his drafting job. There's people like Kathy Hutchinson, who has locked-in syndrome from a brainstem stroke at the age of 45. And it left her that her only conversations could be blinks of her eyes for yes and no. But she became the first person to manipulate a robotic arm using a brain-computer interface and her thoughts so she can enjoy her beloved cinnamon lattes. And then there's Kim O'Shea who became blind from retinitis pigmentosa after the birth of her second child. And she is one of few that has a retinal prosthesis that allows her to see black and white shades of gray movement and some color. Now on the surface, you say this technology is great. It gives these people function. It allows Jim to use his hands. It allows Kathy to manipulate a robotic arm. It allows Kim to see, but it's so much more than that. You see, for Jim, it was the ability to go into a restaurant and feed himself. For Kathy, it was to independently drink her cinnamon lattes and to have rich conversations using a computer. And for Kim, it was the joy of playing with her pets in her backyard and the ability to recognize her husband in a crowd. That's the equalization of technology. And then there's this person who left her wheelchair behind during our entire wedding ceremony. Over 19 years ago, I was implanted with a neural prosthesis that allows me to use my paralyzed legs. And you look at me right now and you might say, you see nothing of that. You say, well, how can you possibly use your legs? And you can't see it. And the reason you can't see it is because it's all implanted inside the body. You see, with the use of electrodes and receivers that look a lot like pacemakers, a little battery power, and the press of a button, I can return to the upright world. <laughs> Pretty awesome, huh? So this is pretty cool technology, and you think, hey, that must help with daily function, and probably help with health, and you're right, it sure does. But it's more than that. It gives me choices in society to choose between standing and the wheelchair. It gives me a feeling of inclusion that the developers have never imagined that this technology can do. Now, just as in flight exploration and in space exploration, there are naysayers. There are people that reject this technology. 
Like there's members of the disability community that say, hey, don't fix me, I'm happy with my disability. There's journalists that are putting misleading information out there saying that advanced technologies are loosely regulated when in fact they are vigorously regulated by the FDA. And then there's the case of the cochlear implant. When it was first introduced, it was rejected by the deaf community. And today, there's over 400,000 people living with cochlear implants that allow them to hear. There's over a hundred, that's right. And there's over 150,000 people using deep brain stimulators to treat brain disorders like Parkinson's disease and essential tremor and dystonia. Now these naysayers have the right to their voice, but they do not have the right to obstruct our access to this technology. Because we, we deserve the choice and freedom is the right to choose. Now when we think about implanted technologies, think about how it integrates with us. So many times we think about technology as something that we wear on our wrist, we put over our eyes, we carry in our pocket. But what happens when technology becomes part of us? Just as there are hidden disabilities like brain injury and post-traumatic stress and epilepsy, there are hidden enabling technologies like implanted devices and some very savvy external ones that give people with disabled conditions the ability to partake in activities that they never were able to do before or that they miss so much. So at the end of the day, it all comes down to how we treat each other as people, how we treat each other as human beings. It's not about the laws and the rules and the signage that we place in front of us. It's about how we treat each other. So the next time you attend an event or create a program or write a blog or patron a business, think about inclusion. We have an opportunity today to use our technological developments to change inclusion across society in the ways that we teach our children how we look at each other and how we interact. And there are bionic pioneers on the front lines today that are blazing the trails forward for us for the future. So let's figure out how we can use the technology as a vehicle for inclusion. Thank you.